Hi, I'm Matt Williams and welcome back to Soil Lab. Today we're going to be comparing the available nutrition across five different garden soils that you may be adding to your raised beds. So more specifically, what questions are we going to be answering and what are we going to be looking at? One of the main questions that we're going to be answering today is, does it really matter what bagged garden soil I buy? Another question that we're going to be answering is, once I've taken that garden soil and filled a new container or a new raised bed, do I need to amend that soil with anything else or does it come with all the nutrients needed in the amounts that our plants need? And that of course will lead into, should I be soil testing or not? So we'll be answering all those questions, just follow along. So to start this study, we went to one big box store, we went to one garden center, and we purchased five commercially available garden soils. All of those were bagged soils. These are five of the more popular garden soils that you're going to find at any big box store or lawn and garden center. With each of those soils, we took five subsamples and ran five soil tests. So we have five soils, we have five soil tests of each soil. So that's 25 total soil tests and 350 total data points that we're going to present to you today, hopefully in a fashion that you can understand and use to help drive decisions in your lawn and garden. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started by walking through each of the different nutrients that we measured. Now remember, we used ion exchange resin capsules to measure all of these. All the data was replicated five times, and this is just to look at those available nutrients, those nutrients that your plants can absorb at the time of planting and throughout our growing season. Just a little bit more about each of those garden soils first. First, one of our first all-purpose garden soil was a 0 .05, 0 .05, 0 .03 for the fertilizer analysis. Now, for those of us unfamiliar, what does that mean? Well, that means that we have about 0.05% nitrogen, about 0.05% phosphate, and about 0.03% uh, potassium or potash. Now, that's not a very high number when we think of synthetic fertilizers like urea maybe being 46% nitrogen. And even some of our organic fertilizers like some of our, uh, some of our blood meals may be pushing 12% nitrogen. So relatively low uh, in terms of the nutri nutrient value as a whole. So as we're editing this video, it came to our attention that we really need to have just a little bit more of a conversation at this point. Now, yes, these bagged soils did have low nutritional values on the label. Recall that's a guaranteed minimum analysis, and these are bags of soil, not bags of fertilizer. Well, that fertilizer that's in those soils, as well as the organics in those soils, are going to make available nutrients as they break down. And so for that reason, even though the fertilizer analysis is low on these bags, we'll often see optimal or even surplus levels of many of our available nutrients. Now back to our soils. This first all-purpose garden soil, it's predominantly, the nutri nutritional value is predominantly from inorganic fertilizers. Some of those, for example, are polymer-coated ammonium nitrate, ammonium phosphate. As you can see, it also contains calcium phosphate, potassium sulfate, and again, an uncoated ammonium phosphate. So we don't see any feather meal, blood meal, soybean meal, or anything like that in, in all-purpose garden soil number one. So that's how you'll see us discussing that soil, is just all-purpose garden soil one. We chose a second very popular all-purpose garden soil as well. Now, it had slightly more nitrogen, the same amount of phosphorus, and slightly more potassium, but those values are still under a tenth of a percent, so relatively low values and really similar products. You can see this has similar ingredients uh, as well but maybe some enhanced non-coated products included as well, likely leading to that slight increase in nitrogen. Now, in addition to those two all-purpose soils, we also had an all-purpose organic soil. And you can note that it was about 0.13% nitrogen and had 0.02% each of our phosphorus and potassium. Now, what was this all-purpose organic composed of? Well, it was feather meal, soybean meal, bone meal, and then sulfate of potash. So those organic products included here in lieu of the polymer-coated synthetic fertilizers that we mentioned before. 
The third all-purpose garden soil that we used um, happened to have both seafood and shrimp meal, as well as dolomitic lime and controlled release fertilizers. So a mix of both synthetics and organics, and these have become quite popular products. You can see it has a bit more nitrogen, a bit more phosphorus, and a bit more potassium than the, uh, the first all-purpose organic that we looked at. So the last soil that we included in this study was an all-natural organic garden soil. And this was made strictly out of poultry manure and feather meal. So the most simple product list that we had here. Note that it also has the most nitrogen of any of those uh, in the study at 0.3%, 0.1% uh, phosphorus, and 0.3% potassium. I just want to reiterate, these are all unique products. They're all commercially available. They're all quite popular, and they're all very similar in their nutrient analysis with those very low nutrient analyses. Now let's take a look at what that means to you in regards to available nutrients when you're planting your garden. So first, we're going to look at the total available nitrogen in these products and then break that out to look at both the ammonium nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen. So if we were to look at this, the bar on the far left, that's just going to represent our total nitrogen. And if we did the math, that would simply be the sum of the nitrate and ammonium. Now, just really briefly, about 90% of the nitrogen absorbed by plants is absorbed as nitrate, so NO3 minus. And that's going to be represented by our gray bar. The bar you see here in blue, that's ammonium. You might also hear that called ammonical nitrogen. Now, plants can absorb that, and some plants like blueberries even preferentially or prefer to absorb that form of nitrogen. But as nitrogen breaks down and our soil microorganisms work on it, ammonium is converted to nitrate. And that can happen pretty rapidly in warm and moist soils. So again, that's our ammonium. We ran the statistics on this and we found really three different trends. The first thing we found is that our all-purpose uh, our all-purpose garden soil number three had the most total nitrogen. The second most total nitrogen we see here on the far left and that's with all-purpose garden soil number one. The other three, although we see them being different maybe in numbers, significantly were considered to be the same. Um, so our all-purpose soil two our organic and our all-natural organic all were about the same in terms of their total available nitrogen. Now, I found it really interesting just to compare the amount of nitrate versus ammonium in each. So let's just take a really quick look at that. In our first garden soil, there was significantly more nitrate than ammonium. So that means there'd be a significantly large portion of available nitrogen immediately at that time of planting your garden. Now, in our second soil, we had more ammonium than nitrate. And so that ammonium is gonna slowly convert to nitrate. Now, what's that mean for me in the garden? That means if I'm using this garden soil, I probably wanna add a little bit of nitrogen at that time of planting. The same trends continue uh, with more nitrate in our all-purpose organic soil, more nitrate in our all-purpose garden soil, and then lastly, in that all-natural organic, it had considerably more ammonium. Now, it looks like there's no nitrate in this soil. Um, at this scale, uh, when we're looking at parts per million, it didn't quite graph out, but I believe there was 0.07 parts per million on the average between those five samples, and really no outliers from that. So what's the takeaway, and how close is this to the optimal range? Well, when we look at the total available nitrogen and overlay the optimal range for your garden, we can see that all-purpose garden soils one and three were just above that optimal range and are gonna be providing plenty of nitrogen to your plants. Whereas the other three, which remember were statistically the same, those all are gonna need nitrogen additions at that time of planting to be sure that you're growing that most nutrient-dense plant that you can. Now, as we move on through some of our other macronutrients, we look at phosphorus. Now, for phosphorus, and I think we'll see it for potassium also, there's no need to talk about statistics here. Um, all of our garden soils provided adequate, um, if not just a little bit much, on the phosphorus side. Um, that phosphorus, remember, in the soil environment, it doesn't move very far or very fast. So this really isn't much of an environmental concern as long as we're keeping that phosphorus in those beds and out of any surface waters. So plenty of phosphorus in each of these commercially available garden soils. We see the same trend to be true here in potassium. So each of these garden soils provides far more potassium than necessary for those plants at that time of seeding. 
Similar to phosphorus, no environmental concerns here. That just means I've got potassium for months, if not years, to come. Let's continue to look at some of our macronutrients. Now, calcium is one that I like to think of quite often, and I like to track and monitor it regularly. If we lack adequate calcium, it could lead to plant health issues. One of the more common ones that we know of is blossom end rot, and we've spoken about that in some of our other videos. We need to ensure that we're maintaining adequate calcium levels while minimizing the amount of wetting and drying, so we want to maintain even soil moisture as best as we can, even soil temperature, and have adequate calcium to reduce the likelihood of that blossom end rot. What we see here with each of these garden soils uh, is that we are in that optimal range in each of those garden soils. Now, the all natural organic, I'm gonna say that that's at or near the optimal range. So if you were thinking that you were a little low, or if your soil test showed that you were a little low, you certainly could add a calcium product. Um, if your pH is fine, we probably wouldn't want to add lime. And so this is an instance where gypsum might be used as a fertilizer element. If you haven't seen the video that we've done on gypsum and its uses, uh, check that out. The link will be in the description below. When we have adequate calcium, usually it's going to outcompete our sodium. But if we're putting sodium in with our garden soil, again, that gypsum might be a good option. So we've looked at our calcium. Let's now look at our sodium. In each of these garden soils, our sodium was a little bit excessive. Now, that sodium in excess can be remedied by using a calcium product like gypsum to displace it, and then we just need to leach it out. Similarly, we could just leach that out and plant. Why am I concerned about excess sodium? Um, some plants are more sensitive than others, and it can cause wilt-like stress symptoms or direct toxicity to your plants. So what am I doing now that I'm armed with this knowledge? I'm just being sure that I well water uh, my garden before planting and before seeding, which most of us are doing anyway. We look at another macronutrient, that's magnesium. Easy to talk about this one as well. There was plenty of magnesium. We were within the optimum range for each of our garden soils. So they're all doing a great job at supplying that magnesium for you. If we wanted to talk statistical significance, we just had one that was statistically lower than the rest, and that was our all-purpose garden soil, too, that was significantly lower, but still within that optimal range. We're going to keep marching on down the line with our macronutrients and look at sulfur. Yet again, this garden soil, each and every one of them, is providing plenty of sulfate for our plants that are actively growing. So no need for additional sulfur with any of the garden soils that we used in this study. Iron is one that's really important in chlorophyll, and we want to make sure that we have that adequate chlorophyll so that our plants are photosynthesizing at their maximum rate. You can see that all except one of our uh, garden soils provided ample or optimal iron. So that all-purpose three, it could use a little supplemental iron. Um, that could be in a chelated form, that could be a foliar application, or that could be incorporated at the time of uh, seeding or planting. Really similar story with zinc. We were a little bit low on zinc with two of our, our all-purpose garden soils and we were adequate with the rest. You may also remember the zinc study that we did earlier where we compared chelated zinc products to non-chelated zinc products. In an instance like this, either would probably do well for you, uh, but certainly you could foliar apply a chelated product or soil apply and incorporate before planting to bump those zinc levels up for both of those all-purpose garden soils. Now, I feel like that's enough charts and graphs and numbers to look at, so let's do some additional micronutrient summaries. Remember, we looked at every micronutrient and macronutrient using those ion exchange resin tests. And what we saw, what some other takeaways were, is that boron was low in every one of those garden soils. And so if we wanted to find a good boron product or a micronutrient package that included boron, that might be handy in most all of these garden soils that we tested. Um, copper was a similar story. It was low in all of these products as well, except for the all natural organic product, and it was at the bottom end of the sufficiency range. And then manganese, another micronutrient, was low in all of these garden soils as well. So just kind of as a blanket statement, we did have the likelihood of being relatively suboptimal across most of our micronutrients and across most of these soils. So what are some of the takeaways from this video today? 
Well, the first takeaway is that not all of these bagged garden soils are created equal. They have very similar makeups and that many of them come from forest byproducts. Uh, many of them have similar nutrient levels in that bag, but they aren't all equally delivering bioavailable or available nutrients for your plants. And that's gonna be essential, especially at that time of planting. Another takeaway is that our available nitrogen was actually the most variable. Well, we know that nitrogen is the most widely applied fertilizer element globally, and this might be why. We're gonna to need to be supplementing nitrogen, whether that's synthetic, organic, or a combination thereof, to be sure that your plants aren't stunted, yellow, and low in protein. So we need to make sure we're getting some supplemental nitrogen put out in most all of these garden soils. The other takeaway, sodium was high across each of the garden soils which we tested. We just need to leach, so apply a little bit of excess irrigation water, leach that sodium out of the root zone of your plants to avoid any of those toxicities. Our other macronutrients, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, those were all at near or above optimal levels. So that's, those are nutrients that we should be pretty comfortable with and probably don't need to apply any supplemental. Iron was low, many of our other micronutrients were low as well, so we may want to consider applications of a micronutrient package. The last takeaway that I have is that all of these are going to provide a great starting point for you to have a healthy garden and nutritive plants. You may want a soil test to see where those deficiencies are, to know what you need to supplement to maximize that nutrient density in that food that's going to be coming from your garden to your table but many of them may need to be amended with some nitrogen or some micronutrients, perhaps some gypsum to displace some sodium. Soil tests, specifically the ion exchange resin soil tests, can help drive those decisions in your lawn and your garden. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, feel free to share, and I'll see you soon in the lab.